We've all seen it in the movies, the quaint wooden cabin in the woods, a perfect retreat for getting away from the stresses life in the big city brings. But as the family settle into their holiday home, they discover that they are not alone. Someone or something is watching their every move. Suddenly, the seclusion they had sought becomes an obstacle used against them as no one can hear their screams. As often as these stories and themes appear in media, things like that couldn't happen in real life, could they? Well, today we explore five times they did. It's 1968 and 42-year-old Richard Robertson has done well for himself. He works as an advertising executive and as the publisher of an art magazine called Impresario. This allowed his wife, Shirley, to stay at home and raise their four children. 19-year-old Richie, 17-year-old Gary, Randy, 12, and their sister Susan, 7. While Richard worked hard, he was also keen to make time for his wife and children, and the family would often spend their summers at a cabin on the Blisswood estate situated on 10 acres of wooded area along the shore of Lake Michigan in the township of Goodhart. The family would have been ecstatic that June as they moved into the Somerset cabin, a log and stone cottage roughly 100 feet from the lakeside. There would be no indications of the horrors that were to come. The Blisswood estate had many cabins, but the distance between them and the transient nature of their occupants meant that if a family were to disappear, it would be safe to assume that their holiday had come to an end and they had simply returned to day-to-day -day life. And so the first signs of something being awry in Somerset Cottage came when a pungent odour emanating from the cottage became strong enough to be noticed by a group of women playing bridge in a small cabin nearby. They alerted caretaker Chauncey Bliss, who went to investigate with his assistant Steve Shenanaque. There was no sign of life at Somerset. A note on the door stated that the family would return sometime between the 7th and 10th of July. This may have seemed strange to Chauncey as it was July 22nd and the family hadn't been seen for 27 days. Still, people's plans change. The smell was powerful, but with little to seemingly be suspicious of, the pair assumed it was simply a raccoon which had died in the crawl space. That was, until they spotted a window that seemingly had several bullet holes through the glass. Bliss knocked on the cabin door and got no reply. The string of a rustic latch assembly had been pulled inside and a second door had been secured with a padlock. Chauncey had built many of the cabins on site, so removing the door wasn't a difficult challenge. Now finally able to get access, the pair were shocked, not only by the odiferous fog that hung in the air, but by the bloody scene that now greeted them. On the floor of the living room lay the body of Shirley Robertson, covered in a plaid blanket. As Chauncey made his way over to the body, he spotted several more lying in pools of blood. Bliss and Shenanaque stormed out of the cabin and called the police. They discovered that Shirley had been shot in the head. Her body was then placed in a position to make it seem as though the brutal attack had a sexual motive, though this was quickly dismissed. The bodies of two of the Robertson's boys, Richie and Gary, were found in the north bedroom. Those of Randall and Susan were found on either side of their fathers. All had been shot in the head, with Richard and Susan seemingly also bearing hammer wounds. Who could have committed such an atrocity and why? Police began to suspect that Richard had been the primary target and their sights quickly turned to his business dealings. It turns out that he wasn't doing as well as his outward lifestyle would suggest. His businesses were in trouble, and Impresario's books were of particular interest to the police. 
They discovered that while he was away, he had left the running of Impresario to a man named Joseph Scalaro III. Investigators found that Scalaro had been embezzling money from the company, and they theorized that Richard had recently discovered this for himself. They posited that Richard had informed Scalaro of his unearthing this fact in a heated phone call. Panicked by this, Scalaro was then accused of traveling to Goodhart with the sole purpose of killing Richard before he had a chance to report his misdeeds. Police stated that Joseph was without a concrete alibi for a 12-hour window on the day of the murders. They also found shell casings that matched those at the cabin at a shooting range Joe was known to frequent, and he also failed two lie detector tests. Despite feeling that they had a solid case against Scalaro because they couldn't find the murder weapons or witnesses, Emmett County prosecutors refused to press charges. However, five years later, in 1973, an Oakland County prosecutor was prepared to charge him with conspiracy to commit murder. Just as the police thought they might be getting somewhere with the case, Joseph Scalaro took his own life. He left a note which read in part, quote, I am a liar, a cheat, a phony, but I am not a killer. I am scared and sick, end quote. To this day, the case is deemed unsolved, and over the subsequent years, many theories have been put forward by amateur sleuths. These range from serial killers that operated in the area at the time to the rather outlandish idea that Chauncey Bliss slaughtered the family after a perceived slight by Richard. The truth behind what happened that night in June 1968 may never be revealed. Born in 1915, David Aikman came from a very musical family, and once he got his first banjo at age 12 years old, he didn't look back. He began playing at local events and dances and would eventually participate in a talent show where the presenter forgot his name and so announced him as Stringbean due to his height and skinniness. The name stuck, and over the years he would add singing and comedy to his repertoire. In 1945, he was invited to perform on the Grand Ole Opry, becoming one of its major stars by the 1950s. Over the years, despite his success, Stringbean kept the mindset of his youth growing up during the Great Depression, and so he lived a simple life. He and his wife Estelle lived in a small cabin near Ridgetop, Tennessee, and David would often hunt and fish for food. By 1973, Stringbean had recorded seven albums and starred in a TV show, Hee Haw, though the only outward signs of his success were his Cadillac and colored TV. It was well known that David and Estelle were frugal and that David had a distrust of banks. This led to whispers around Nashville that the Aikmans had a small fortune hidden away in their little cabin. This rumor made its way to the ears of cousins John and Marvin Brown. The pair then devised a plan. The Grand Ole Opry is a weekly country radio concert as it goes out live. They'd know when the cabin would be empty and so would raid it using the radio show to gauge when the pair would return. On the night of November the 10th, 1973, the cousins ransacked the cabin in search of the supposed hidden fortune. The hunt turned up nothing, however, so they decided to lie in wait for the Aikmans, possibly, to force them to reveal the location of the money at gunpoint. When Stringbean and his wife returned home, they immediately knew something was awry. David was armed and went to find out what was going on while Estelle stayed back. An altercation ensued, resulting in Stringbean being shot dead. Estelle, obviously horrified by what she had seen, begged for her life before she too was shot. The killers then made off with guns, chainsaws, and $250 they found in one of Stringbean's pockets. Funeral workers later found over $2,500 hidden in Estelle and David's clothing. The couple's bodies were discovered the day after the attack by their good friend and fellow country star, Lewis Jones. 
It would take a year before the cousins were brought to justice. In November 1974, both pleaded guilty to burglary during the trial, but each blamed the other for the murders. Due to Tennessee's felony murder rule, the fact that both admitted to the burglary meant they were both also guilty of murder in the eyes of the law. Both would receive 198 year sentences, 99 years for each victim. Marvin died in prison in 2003, while John was released in 2014 after serving 41 years of his sentence. The legend of the large sum of cash hidden inside the cabin was rarely spoken of after the tragic event. However, more than two decades later, it was claimed that $20,000 was found behind a brick in the fireplace. In December of 1990, several members of the TD family were preparing to spend their Christmas together at a remote cabin in the mountains of Utah. The family consisted of husband Rolf TD, his wife Kay, and their two daughters, 20-year-old Lene and 16-year-old Trish. Kay's mother, Beth, had also joined them at the cabin, which her daughter had described as the Teddy's tranquility due to the beautiful surroundings and peaceful atmosphere. This tranquility was helped in no small part by the fact that the cabin was located two and a half miles off-road and could only be accessed by snowmobile during the winter. Inside the home was a scene that wouldn't look out of place on the front of a Christmas card. Stockings hung above the fireplace, and the centerpiece was a large decorated tree surrounded by presents. With more family members set to arrive on December 22nd, the TDs set off for Salt Lake City to finish their Christmas shopping. That winter was particularly bitter, and Linnae recalls that her hands were freezing as she and her family made their way back to the secluded home. Desperate to escape the cold, Lene, Beth and Kay raced ahead and reached the cabin before Rolf and Trisha. Upon entering the residence, Lene ran upstairs to run her cold hands under the hot water tap. As she did so, she noticed a grey figure attempting to hide behind the refrigerator. Initially, she thought it may have been one of her cousins planning to scare her. But the truth would quickly be revealed when 25-year-old Von Lester Taylor and 21-year-old Edward Stephen Delly stepped from the shadows, both brandishing guns. The two men had met after the pair had been paroled to a halfway house, which they had walked out of just a week earlier. Von Taylor had been imprisoned for aggravated burglary while Edward Delly was back on the streets after serving just 12 months of a five-year sentence for arson. As terrible as their crimes had been, they would soon surpass them with acts of true evil. As the three women stood shocked at the scene they were now presented with, Kay did her best to try and defuse the situation. The pair weren't to be reasoned with, however, and without so much as an utterance, they took the guns and shot Kay and her mother Beth dead. Before Lene could process what had just happened, her senses locked on to the sound of snowmobiles getting closer. Her father and sister were closing in on the cabin with no idea of the horrors that awaited them. As they pulled up on their snowmobile, they were ambushed by Ed Delly, who led them into the cabin at gunpoint. The Christmassy scene they had hoped to have been met with was now replaced by a bloody murder scene, along with the sight of Lene being held at gunpoint. Rolf was asked if he had any money, and he reached into his pockets and gave them all he had. Vaughn then instructed Ed to shoot him. Initially, seeming to be following orders, Ed cocked his gun, but then refused to fire. Enraged by this, Vaughn then drew his gun, pointed it directly at Rolf's head, and pulled the trigger. Nothing. He pulled the trigger again, but the weapon refused to go off until he did so a third time. The sound of the gun firing rang out as Rolf crumpled to the floor. The two murderers then doused the house in petrol before setting it ablaze. They then forced the girls at gunpoint to load two snowmobiles with items before having the sisters drive them from the crime scene. 
As the girls rode off with the killers sat behind them, Trish had thoughts of crashing the vehicle and flinging her captor into a tree, but she did not want to leave her sister behind. As they approached the gates of the trail's end, they spotted their uncle Randy, who had just arrived. He raved at the girls, believing the boys riding with them were boyfriends he hadn't been told about. Not wanting to risk his life, the girls rode past their perplexed uncle and headed to the family's Lincoln. The two gunmen then bundled the women into the car and set off. Once more, driving past Randy, who was waving his hands, trying to flag them down. By now, he knew something was not right. But before he could act on his suspicions, his attention was drawn to a third snowmobile making its way from the direction of the cabin. As it drew close, he could see the rider was severely injured. The head was swollen and bloodied. It was Rolf, the girl's father. Miraculously, he had survived. After informing Randy of what just happened, the pair raced after the killers and the two women they were holding hostage. They quickly managed to catch up with them, but what now? They knew the men had weapons and were seemingly more than happy to use them. Randy had a mobile phone, but in 1990, service was patchy to say the least. Luckily, however, as they left the canyon, he managed to get a signal and dialed 911. Moments later, and a police car is now in hot pursuit of the Lincoln in what quickly becomes a 90 mile an hour chase. The hunt would end when the Lincoln spun off an embankment. The sisters were able to make their way out of the vehicle and were now safe as the two killers suddenly became very compliant. Now, they were faced with law enforcement. The pair faced a raft of charges and would receive a shock when they came face to face with Rolf during the trial, as they were not told that he had survived. Von Taylor accepted a plea deal where he admitted to the murders with all other charges being dropped. This still resulted in him receiving a death sentence. It was expected that Edward Delhi would receive the same sentence, but due to a holdout jury member, he instead was found guilty of second degree murder and received a life sentence. In 1963, Herbert William Mullen was voted most likely to succeed by his classmates at San Lorenzo Valley High School. However, it's likely that the endeavors they foresaw him succeeding in wouldn't have included his quest to prevent earthquakes by means of committing ritualistic murder. It's safe to say that Mullen's life took a steep decline after his graduation. The spark for his downfall came when his close friend Dean Richardson died in a tragic accident in 1965. This incident had a profound effect on Herbert, who built shrines in his dead friend's honor and became infatuated with the afterlife and thoughts of reincarnation. He also developed a drug problem, and it's believed his excessive use of LSD and marijuana may have contributed to his being diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia in 1969. Herbert spent several years in and out of various mental hospitals, but was seen as being no harm to himself or others. This would all change in 1972. He now lived with his parents in Felton, California, and as his birthday approached on April 18th, he felt anxious. The date of his birthday fell on the anniversary of the San Francisco earthquake of 1906, a magnitude of 7.9 quake that leveled 80% of the city and claimed over 3,000 lives. He felt that the only way to stop massive earthquakes like that of 1906 was to offer nature a blood sacrifice. Of course, the bloodshed of the two great wars had kept things relatively quiet and Herbert would be safe this birthday as the Vietnam War was still in full flow with enough blood spilt to keep nature satiated. This was until late 1972 as US forces began to pull their ground troops out of the country. In his mind, this would lead to a massive natural disaster and so 
According to Herbert, his father ordered him via telepathy to start taking lives. The first of his victims was a homeless man named Lawrence White, who had offered to help Herbert out when he pretended to have car trouble. As the man looked at his car's engine, Mullen beat him with a baseball bat. He would later state that the man had looked like Jonah from the Bible and had told him through telepathy to kill me so that others may be saved. His next victim was a 24-year-old woman named Mary Guilfoyle, who had been picked up by Herbert while hitchhiking. What he did to that poor girl, we can't say here, but it perhaps played upon his own mind as on November 2nd, 1972, Herbert visited a confessional booth in St. Mary's Catholic Church in Los Gatos, there, he states he explained the situation to Father Henri Tomé, but Mullen also claims that at that moment, Father Tomé offered himself as a sacrifice, and so he beat him to death. A parishioner ran to get help, but Mullen had fled. In January 1973, Herbert was said to have attempted to join the Marines so as to be able to kill people legally. Though he passed the physical and psychiatric exams, he was rejected when the record of his arrests and bizarre behavior were revealed. By this stage, he had given up drugs and blamed them for his actions and the way his life had turned out. In an effort to get some form of revenge, he sought to find and kill the man he blamed for getting him addicted to them in the first place, a man named Jim Gianera. The last address he had for Gianera was a cabin in the hills above Santa Cruz, and on January the 25th, that's where he headed. Mullen knocked on the cabin door, but instead of being met by his former schoolmate, he was now face to face with a woman named Kathy Francis. She lived in the house with her young children, David and Damon, along with her husband Robert, who was out at the time. She explained that Jim no longer lived there, but had moved to an address not far away. Tragically, this information wasn't enough for Herbert, who again stated that the family offered themselves as sacrifices. He set about taking their lives and then went after Gianera. Mullen found him at the new address and asked him why he had sold him the drugs he now believed had ruined his life. It's unlikely he could have given any answer that would have quelled Mullen's rage. Gianera and his wife became Herbert's next victims. In early February, a group of teenagers, Robert Spector, Brian Scott Card, David Olicker, and Mark Drybelbus were camping in Santa Cruz State Park when Mullen's happened upon their campsite. He accused them of camping illegally and told them to leave as they were polluting the forest. After they told him to go away, he returned the next day and shot them all dead before stealing a rifle the boys had had. He would use this weapon on his next and final victim, Fred Abbey Perez. Mullen was driving his pickup when he spotted the 72-year-old Perez doing some gardening. He then turned the car around and parked up before shooting him from the vehicle. Perez's neighbor saw all of this happen and quickly alerted the police, who were able to finally capture the serial killer. Detectives investigating the case had initially failed to link the murders as each victim was so different from the last. Mullen's crimes were further obfuscated by the fact that another serial killer had been operating in the area at the same time, Ed Kemper, the co-ed killer. Herbert Mullen would eventually be sentenced to life and would be denied parole eight times before dying in prison aged 75 in 2022. In 1989, Eben McDowell was a man obsessed. He desperately coveted his grandfather's Mauser 6mm rifle, but there was one man he saw as keeping it from him, his father, Robert. Robert seemingly had good reason for keeping weapons out of the hands of his son as 
Eben had recently threatened the family with an axe. You see, along with being obsessed, Eben was troubled. Growing up, he had always appeared shy and quiet, but his teachers at Stanford Central School noticed changes in his personality over the course of his junior and senior years. This coincided with a dip in his academic performance, which saw him barely squeak through graduation. Eben was later diagnosed as suffering from schizophrenia, a long-term mental health condition that doctors often describe as a type of psychosis, where the person may not always be able to distinguish their own thoughts from reality. The condition alone doesn't cause a person to become violent, however. The symptoms were largely managed with medication, but Eben often found they made him dizzy or drowsy, and so he would stop taking them. It's thought that this contributed to an event in 1988 when, after an argument with his father, Eben, also known as Ben, broke into his friend's house brandishing a knife and a rock, stating he was going to get him. Though it's not known whether he meant his father or the person whose home he had just broken into, Ben was quickly arrested and $1,700 he had set aside for buying a gun was confiscated. He was then admitted to the Binghamton Psychiatric Center for several months before moving to a halfway house and then a psychiatric hospital. Eventually, he would return to Binghamton after the incident with his family and the axe. By June 1989, things outwardly at least seemed to have improved. It's reported that Eben had moved into his maternal grandfather's hunting lodge just south of Hobart, where the family would spend many a summer's day. Such was the case on June the 23rd, 1989. Ben's mother, Elizabeth, younger brother, Daniel, grandfather, Charles, and father, Robert, were all spending their time in the cabin and the surrounding woodland. It's not known how Ben acted that day or how things were between him and the often target of his rage, his father. What is known, however, is that Eben had been planning something abominable. Two weeks prior, he had finally managed to purchase a weapon, a 12-gauge pump-action shotgun. He had done so by lying on the form which asked if he had ever used illegal drugs or if he had a criminal record. He now had a shotgun, five deer slugs and a box of birdshot in his possession. As night fell on June the 23rd, Eben set about slaughtering his family. While the body of Charles was found in his bed, those of Robert and Daniel were found outside by a pond. Elizabeth's body was in the water and police theorized she had been trying to hide under a jetty when her son fired at her. After the murders, Eben set off for his father's offices and on its door he left a note to Robert's business partner, Carl F. Becker. It read, quote, Fritz, he is at Murphy's Lake. Bring the cops. He is armed. I am dead. Robert McDowell. This note by Eben M. This is not a joke. End quote. Carl found the note the following morning and the police were alerted. Murphy's Lake was once one of Eben's hangouts, a place where he would often be found drinking with friends. As officers arrived, they found Eben still armed and a standoff ensued, which lasted several hours until the gunman fell quiet. Moments later, he stepped out from his cover, placed the butt of the shotgun under his arm and took a shot at a deputy roughly 25 yards away. The shot missed and several officers returned fire, with one bullet hitting Eben in the chest. The standoff was now over. The bullet wound proved fatal. We'll never know what caused the son to murder his family, but it's believed he had planned for the standoff to be a way for him to end his life. Thank you for watching. If you enjoy the show and would like to help support the channel, consider becoming a channel member. As a member, you'll have access to exclusive posts and videos, amongst other things. Right then, take care, and I'll see you next time with another story that will make you say, well, I never.